Repeat, and uh, are joining us via Ring Central, either by video or by phone. You will be muted until about 11:40 when we open it up for questions. Uh, if you're joining us by video, please feel free to drop your questions in the chat box. We will answer them as we go during the Q&A time uh, allotted. If you're joining us by phone, please hold your questions until we open it up for questions. Uh, you will uh, be prompted to unmute, unmute yeah. your line uh, by pressing star six. Uh, okay. In the spirit of inclusive, inclusivity and to ensure the efficiency of the meeting, we strongly encourage attendees to ask one question or make one comment at a time. If we don't get to your question, we will have our experts address them and send those to all participants in a follow-up email. That is for those who were able to RSVP and are joining us uh, via Ring Central. We will use the mute button throughout the meeting and during the Q&A time allotted to ensure only one person is speaking at a time. And during the Q&A time allotted, we ask that you raise your hand if you have a question and we will unmute your line. Uh, for those of you joining via Facebook, thank you so much for joining us. This is uh, the first time that we try this out. Uh, we'll do our best to address your questions in a timely fashion. Thanks again, everyone, for joining. Um, so with that, we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, Central Health is the local healthcare district that ensures Travis County residents with low income can get quality health care. Uh, we're primarily funded by local property taxes. We were created by, uh, in 2004 by Travis County voters. And we're a separate subdivision of the state of Texas um, charged with providing, uh, the, uh, pro providing health care to people with low income. Uh, we rely heavily on demographic and clinical data as well as public input to ensure that our strategic priorities and budget align with the health care needs of our community. And one of, those, uh, one of the tools that we use to collect and re report data to guide our efforts uh, and our work is our demographic report. Uh, so today, uh, during session one of three, we will uh, review data trends as, it, as they relate to, to poverty and the different um, demographic shifts um, uh, here in Travis County. Uh, next week, we will address access to care, enrollment, and uh, use of healthcare services by our uh, patient population. And then the following week, we will address burdens of disease, uh, so more around chronic conditions. With that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Sarita Clark Leach, who is our Director of Analytics and Reporting, and JP Eichmiller, who is our Senior Director of Strategy and Information Design. Um, go ahead, JP and Sarita. Can you all hear me now? We can hear you, Jippy. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you for the introduction, Yvonne. Um, for the sake of brevity, I'm going to run us through this presentation and then Sarita and I will both be available to answer any questions. Um, in the future presentations you mentioned, Sarita will be uh, taking a more of a leading role presenting the info. So first, let's just get into uh, what this is we're talking about. What is the 2020 demographic report? Um, it's our third iteration of this reporting. We pre presented our first report in 2015, and that report really focused on families and poverty, as well as the racial demographics of the entire Travis County population. Um, so that, that report was limited in that we did not have incorporate any of our own patient level data. In 2017, we presented our second report. In this report, we began to focus in on specific neighborhoods that were experiencing high levels of poverty. Uh, we, we identified nine of these areas, these we call them focus areas, and provided demographic analysis as well as some measurements related to social determinants of health. Um, we also, uh, for the first time, presented some patient level data related to the diagnosis and treatment of chronic conditions. Um, however, our ability to analyze and report data has grown exponentially in the past three years, and that's really represented in this 2020 report. Uh, as you'll see, we're able to provide much deeper analysis than our previous reports. Um, and this includes uh, analysis of the total population and counts of families and households that are in poverty, um, changes in poverty over the past 20 years, as well as a five-year projection up to 2025. 
Uh, we also have demographic and geographic analysis of the residents we enroll and the patients we serve. And we have new data points de detailing the burden of chronic diseases within specific Travis County neighborhoods. We've also included data regarding transportation access and insurance coverage, uh, to, just to provide additional perspective on factors affecting the health of our low-income low population. Before um, we start diving into it, I want to cite our sources. Uh, for the poverty trends, we uh, relied on Claritas, which is a research firm that provides us income, demographic, and insurance status info at the census tract level. And our own eligibility and claims data um, was used to analyze the location and demographics of who we are enrolling and providing services to. So how are we using the information that's contained in this report? Well, probably the most visible use is for facility planning. Uh, we've been offering guidance and support to our planners as we decide where to build, what to build, and how large to build. Uh, we're also measuring trends in med medical service delivery, enrollment in our health coverage programs. This is providing us new understandings of where people from different communities are accessing services and where we might need to alter strategies for getting residents enrolled in our programs. Um, we've also created new baselines for disease prevalence in our communities. And this will allow us to come back at future dates and report on what changes have occurred with the prevalence of chronic conditions. And finally, we're using the information this report to help inform our communications and outreach teams in their ongoing efforts to educate the community on the services we offer. So before we dive in, I want to quickly discuss our standard geographic measurement in this report. And these are census tracts, um, which some of you may or may not be familiar with. Um, throughout this report, we utilize census tracts to identify population demographic ten trends. Excuse me. Um, census tracts are designed to have a population somewhere between 1,200 and 8,000 people with an optimum size of 4,000. And if you um, within within Travis County, we have 217 unique census tracts, and the largest being, largest population being in Pflugerville, um, 26,000. If you look at this map, um, what you can see is kind of down the central corridor between I-35 and Mopac, the tracts tend to be much smaller, whereas you go out to the east and west and they get larger. And the reason for that is strictly because of population. Every 10 years when we get a new census out, um, they start cutting these tracks up so that they get those populations to be more similar. Um, so basically when you see the central corridor and they're small like that, it means you can't really fit many more people in there. As we um, go forward, we're gonna start cutting up these bigger and bigger tracks to where they'll look more like the central corridor. In fact, when the new tracks come out or released, we're expecting to have about 290 tracks. So this will increase by 70 throughout the county. Okay, so this is the uh, first data set we want to show you. This is the 2010 Travis County um, families in poverty. Obviously, our pop this population, the low income population, has changed a lot in the last 10 years, as well as the general population. Um, to kind of give you some reference to what we're looking at here, um, obviously, the darker, the redder um, it indicates the higher concentration of families in poverty. This area to the north here, um, this is Runberg. Again, these are very small census tracts, uh, geographically speaking. So what you're seeing is a very, very large concentrations of poverty in a very small area. Whereas um, farther to the east here, this is um, the Colony Park neighborhoods. So we see high numbers of families in poverty, but they're much more dispersed, larger area. Um, this is East Austin. Montopolis and East Riverside. This would be South Congress right here. And as we keep going farther south, this is Dove Springs. So if we take it to the present day, um, as you can see, we see quite a, a dramatic shift, um, as well as some things that have really remained the same. Um, differences, obviously, we see uh, much more dispersed low-income populations. Um, uh, this is to the west. This is Jonestown, Leander, um, Lago Vista. Um, and then kind of uh, farther north, this is Wells Branch and Pflugerville, Maynard, Hornsby Bend and Del Valley. 
again, um, while we're seeing this dispersion, uh, we also need to recognize this is over a much, much larger area. So when we go back and look at areas like Runberg, um, St. John's neighborhood, just east of I-35, uh, Montopolis and Doe Springs, you get, we need to remember this is where the, the, where the greatest number, where the greatest concentration still remains in these small census tracts, where there's just a whole lot more volume of people living in poverty. We go for, forward five years, um, a lot of it looks this pretty similar with a few exceptions and somewhat surprising, I think, to some. This Jonestown area actually kind of rises to the top, um, to this highest level. Um, we also see uh, um, this Oak Hill kind of get up to that second highest here. And even some, this area to the very far uh, southwest, uh, just south of Bee Caves, kind of goes up um, in its concentrations of poverty. So here's a side by side just to kind of give you some perspective. Um, you, know, you can look at this and just kind of see what we're talking about. You know, we see a, an increase in the overall population and an increase in our population that's in poverty as well. So how do we use this data? I mean, what, what, what are we actually, how are we actually actuating it? And this is um, what we did. This is a look back to our 2017 report. What we did was we identified the 40 census tracts that had those high and uh, kind of, we call moderate, but second highest level concentrations in poverty. Um, so these are the ones that really uh, rose to those highest levels. And this was in 2017. So we went, we go uh, to the present day now and we see some changes. Um, we see some new areas popping up and we see some areas that, um, used to be at that highest level kind of going down to the more moderate level. Um, first off, we see Jonestown. This wasn't there in 2017. And this uh, northern portion of Maynard wasn't there as well. Uh, we also have Wells Branch here, uh, just to the west of I-35 showing up. Um, and we have some areas, as I mentioned, Pflugerville, which was at that highest level, has now gone down to a more moderate level. Um, same with Hornsby Bend right here and same with the southern portion of Colony Park. So here's that side-by-side -side comparison, um, again, to give you some perspective. So we've actually, we, again, we've seen more of a disbursement. We have more areas where we're picking up higher levels of, of poverty, but we're also seeing some of those areas kind of um, tone down, go into lower levels. So once we have um, these areas identified for our 2020 report, um, what we did went about was separating them into what we call 12 focus areas. Uh, and this allows us to analyze and compare the needs and the level of services across the county in those areas. In the previous report, as I mentioned, we had nine focus areas. So these three additional areas um, were created by what we did was we separated Colony Park from Hornsby Bend because we recognized after the past report that these are two very distinct and different areas. Um, we had Leander and Lago Vista show up. And that wasn't in the previous report. And we separated Pflugerville, um, the Pflugerville census tract, from uh, what we call these North Travis County area. We did that because these areas are actually primarily unincorporated. Um, so they have much different needs than areas uh, like Pflugerville or Austin or Maynard, where they don't have a city government representing them. Um, so doing all this, what it allowed us to do is to compare and contrast some of the um, differences related to enrollment utilization. Um, for example, one thing we, we noted um, was that there was a much higher percentage of our black population in East Central Austin um, that was enrolling and utilizing our services than in areas such as Colony Park, Pflugerville, and Maynard. What this indicated to us is that there's a lower socioeconomic status among the black population in the urban core versus many of the black residents in the suburban and rural areas of the county. So here's, I'm just gonna give you some of our quick summary findings and I'll wrap it up. Um, Concentra our concentrations of poverty remain highest in Austin along the I-35 corridor. 
And um, due to significant population increases, uh, new census tract boundaries coming in 2022 will split up uh, census tracts in Pflugerville, Hornsby, Van, and Dell Valley. And this will likely result in dramatic changes in the number of families in poverty per census tract. And while poverty remains highest along the I-35 corridor, um, they are also increasing regionally, um, particularly in areas adjacent to Travis County. Uh, Low-income communities in Austin and Northwest Travis County report low rates of household vehicle access, with more than one in 10 households lacking access to a vehicle. And areas with uh, high poverty rates also report low rates of employer-based insurance. Um, as Yvonne mentioned, we'll be back next Friday um, and we're going to start getting into our own data. Um, it's going to hopefully be very interesting for y'all. Um, we'll start looking at who we enrolled and where they enrolled and where they're getting services. And on the 18th, we'll be looking into the disease prevalence within specific communities. And finally, if you uh, have some extra time in your hand, you want to dive in this data yourself, uh, please visit our new uh, uh, reinvigorated website. Uh, hover over the R Work tab and then click on 2020 Demographic Report. And with that, I will uh, stop sharing my screen and take it back to Yvonne. All right. Thank you, JP. Uh, thank you so much. And so at this point, uh, I'm going to let's, let's go ahead and open it up for questions. We're going to be watching the chat box and the, the comments on Facebook Live as well. Uh, just to get us started, uh, JP, um, how do you how do you guys foresee um, the COVID-19 and the economic uh, effects creating a shift uh, in levels of poverty across the county? That's a good question, Fon. Um, we have heard, uh, I don't think we have enough information locally yet. We've heard some conflicting information when the, um, at the beginning because of the stimulus, because of the uh, um, uninsured or or the unemployment benefits were so high that it was actually um, was not driving up poverty. But as we know, since uh, I believe the summer, that has changed significantly. So I would I would find it hard pressed to believe with Austin Travis County's large service industry and music industry um, and the effects that that could be having that it would not um, have a have a negative effect on uh, driving up poverty. Great. Thank you. And then uh, just looking at the, uh, the slide where you, uh, you uh, demonstrated the, how the de demographics shifted from 2010 to 2020, what, um, in, your, in your research, what, are, what do you think are the contributing factors to that, to the shift in demographics? Very dramatic. Yeah. Well, you know, it's, it's not just um, affluent folks moving to Travis County. Um, there are uh, people coming from across the socioeconomic ladder. Um, you know, the, there is a dispersion that's occurring both, and, and that, I think that goes for all socioeconomic classes. Um, you know, as we've seen the populations in areas such as Dell Valley, such as Colony Park, um, Hornsby Bend, and Pflugerville is exploding. Um, at, across all levels. So, you know, we're seeing, um, we are seeing movement within the county, but we're also seeing, uh, you know, some, some immigration from other areas. That's great. Thank you. Uh, does anyone, would, would anybody uh, like to ask a question before I, I keep going with my own questions? I want to make sure that uh, we leave room for, for people to ask questions. Ricardo, would you like to unmute your line? It says the current federal state administration has isolated residents in central Texas that are undocumented. How are these populations being accounted for? What could be done to make sure that they're not left out? I think that has to do with the census and I'd like to speak to that, uh, JP. Um, and I'm sorry, are you, let me read your chat. So we have, um, Saria, do you want to, pitch in at all as far as undocumented and how we are monitoring that population that we serve? Sure. And, you know, the undocumented population is, a, is, is um, included among the folks we serve. And, and we certainly, um, 
check to ensure that they are receiving the same level of access as, as our other patients um, and enrollees. But um, insofar as understanding undocumented who are not part of our population, those that's information that we're, we are blind to at the moment um, in, in that we haven't uh, procured that specifically. It's, we understand that it's a population that we need to be mindful of, um, whether we've gone out and explored um, those, those external um, data sources to understand how those uh, un undocumented who are not currently part of the central health population um, are faring relative to the undocumented in our population. That level of research hasn't happened yet. Um, and, and it may be something that we we look at in a certain way in the future. How do you foresee I hope us? That answers your question, Sarita. How do you foresee us looking into it in the future? Sure. So, so to leverage those data from other local entities and, and to understand what the magnitude of the population, the total population within Travis County is, um, and if in fact that you know most of them are below two hundred percent of the federal poverty income level, to understand the socioeconomics of that group and um, to understand you know uh, how many of them are uninsured because you can be undocumented and still be above the socioeconomic status of the population you serve and you can also be insured so it's getting our our, um, our minds wrapped around what the what the actual undocumented population looks like instead of treating them as a monolith and, and understanding them as this you know just this indigent population who um, don't have access to care. We don't know that that's the case. We, we can assume it is, but we don't know. That's, what we're for that. that's great. Thank you, Sarita. Uh, Shelly, did you have a question that you need, you need to ask? I believe it was about around technology. Yeah, I was actually curious. I know you all have data on who has access to a car. Another thing that I know we have to think about is access to technology. Are you able to collect that data? Are you collecting that data? Kind of what are your what are your thoughts and your approach to to that aspect of healthcare and, and what central health does? So we're not directly collecting that data at this time. However, we understand that um, it is important that our our uh, population has access to technology as it's um, especially as we're moving more and more towards uh, telehealth. So again, um, more more exploration to be done, for sure. Yeah, and I, I believe the Census Bureau um, in the last few years has begun reporting on access to uh, home Wi-Fi. Um, but I would caveat that with what we have discovered in a lot of our work and research is that um, Census Bureau data um, it, it gets less and less reliable when you get at the at the like the census tract level. And um, we're, we're trying to go the opposite direction. We're trying to nail down um, information as hyper locally as we can. So um, we've got, we, yeah, we've got some work to do on that. I just wanted to um, kind of um, piggyback on that question. Um, are you, are there any thoughts about any kind of data sharing agreements with perhaps the school districts? I know that AISD, for example, perhaps other school districts um, have a program where they um, distributed a lot of laptop data and provided Wi-Fi access to low-income students. Just wondering if there's any thoughts about working with them to fill in those gaps. So, so I'm sorry, we, we seem to be, um, you know, we're getting these questions and I don't know um, that we're really the right folks. Um, to answer those those types of questions, they do speak to contracting with other um, entities and providers. And, and um, while all of these are good questions, and um, you know they they will be answered at some point. I don't know that this is the the venue for it because um, we're we're here to answer the questions about the demographic reports, and um, and so. Yeah, we, we may not have some of the answers to some of the questions that you're looking for. Um, that, and, and I see Monica is on, on the call, so she may be able to speak to that a little better than I can. And 
it, let me just briefly, I, I think that that is a, a fantastic idea. One of our um, strategic plan budget resolution priorities for, for fiscal year 2020 is to um, fully explore how to um, most appropriately uh, implement um, tele telemedicine, virtual care, electronic consults. And I think that um, read one of uh, bridging the uh, digital divide and the digital gap is going to be essential for us to most effectively and appropriately um, use uh, telehealth and virtual visits and uh, you know el electronic telemonitoring, those types of tools. And so I think that reaching out to AISD to, um, you know, determine that have they provided a broadband access or subscriptions, have they provided um, uh, equipment or uh, tablets to folks, I, I think that that's a fantastic idea that we can work into um, that priority for fiscal year, this fiscal year 2021 that we're in now. Thank you, Monica. Uh, I hope that um, addresses your question, Yvonne. If not, we're happy to. I'm happy to uh, schedule uh, a follow up to continue the conversation um, and, and, and with the, with the right people. Uh, I believe Mr. Gwen had a question. Um, Mr. Gwen, can you can you please? Uh, yes. What, what was it that you? Uh, wanted I was to wondering what is the definition of poverty and how is the data collected uh, for these reports? How often are they updated? That's an excellent question. Yeah, okay. sure. Um, and poverty is, uh, it's actually a, a level that's set by the Census Bureau annually. Um, and they do it by, in increments of uh, household or family, excuse me, family size. So for example, an individual, um, I don't know it down to the dollar, but an individual being below the, under the family, federal poverty level is about 12,500. Um, a family of four would be about twenty-four thousand um, dollars, and this is a you know a standard that's used um, nationally for all different purposes, um, state by state, local governments, federal governments. Um, so you'll hear this used uh, quite often, especially in the, when it comes to assistance programs such as what we offer. Um, in regards to the report, um, we had a our first two came two years apart, and then we had an extra year. So this was three years after the uh, following one. We are um, we're taking a little bit different approach with this report. Um, we're treating it uh, as a much more of a living document and database. We've already been doing updates to it and doing internal analysis with the information we built. So we haven't decided when we're going to uh, release a next hard copy version like this, but it probably won't be more in two years. Okay, so sometimes I hear the term twice the poverty level or three times the poverty level. Are you, are you doing that or just one time, whatever the federal guidelines are? Um, we, we do, yeah, okay, so right. Um, so you'll hear twice the poverty level. So that would mean uh, an individual, for example, who is making uh, like $25,000 or something, or we set that level at $25,000. Um, we, we have different levels uh, that we use for different programs. Our medical access program, which is often referred to MAP, is generally for individuals at or below the federal poverty level. Um, and then we have other programs, such as what we, a new one we call MAP Basic, which goes up to 200 or twice the, twice the poverty level. Okay. And this is just a curiosity question. I see there's a lot of areas that are in poverty in the city of Austin. And I, I can't help but wonder, you know, the homes in those areas are like, Four hundred thousand dollars, three to four hundred thousand dollars. So, where are these people living, and how can they afford to live in a high property tax area? Yeah, that's a great question um, and a very good observation. 
So I think you're right, um, or I don't think you, you are right. The, the prices of single family homes um, in Austin and throughout Travis County have skyrocketed. So where are these people um, living? Well, there, there still remains a lot of multifamily, low income housing stock, um, both uh, uh, stock that's uh, low income, like subsidized low income housing, as well as non-subsidized. So, um, you know, if you go to those areas, um, I mean, you can even do a, a Google search and look in areas in Runberg, in Montopolis, um, there, there still remains a, quite a significant amount of low income multifamily housing. And there still remains a lot of uh, lower income families who are, who are just remaining um, in the housing that they've lived in. Um, you know, kind of before some of the dramatic shifts occurred. Um, you know, you can still see those neighborhoods if you go to Montopolis. Um, you see them in East Austin, although they're very dispersed. You see it in Runberg. So you're right. The selling point is very high, but there still remains folks who are choosing to, to remain in their houses. All right, thank you. Well, with that, um, this concludes the first session, the first Q&A session for the Central Health 2020 Demographic Report. Uh, they are meant to be uh, very quick uh, sessions, but I, we do encourage you to sign up for the one next week. I'm going to drop the, that's a long link, uh, the link to the chat box. Um, and that is the Eventbrite link. Uh, I hope that is the, what I... Nope, that's not it. That's the Facebook link, but I'm going to drop out and drop the Eventbrite link right now. In case you haven't, uh, you haven't signed up. And um, so we encourage you to sign up for the next one where we will talk about access, enrollment and utilization as it pertains to the demographic report. And, um, and then the following will be around disease prevalence and chronic chronic conditions. And uh, we will uh, encourage you to send any questions our way. Uh, if you just email communications at centerhealth.net, communications at centerhealth.net, and we'll be happy to uh, get back to you. Yvonne, there was one more question from Ernesto Rodriguez. It, it, he said, um, can this information be used to better understand the homeless population? Sarita, do you want to take that? So uh, the homeless population is it's um, it's a little there they are included in this report to the extent that we may have addresses for them. Um, this report does speak to their utilization. It speaks to their um, enrollment, but it won't necessarily map them out geographically for you to understand where they may be in terms of, you know, whether they're east or west, north or south. But um, they are included in the population. And, and this report is really, an, it's, it's a very broad overview. And um, we do plan to drill down into specific subpopulations to understand what level of service we may need for them. Um, so it's continued work, you know, this is, again, it's an overview and, and gives us um, indications as, as to what we need to drill down into and uh, populations that we need to focus on and, and, um, and uh, gain more insight into. Thank you, Sarita. I see that uh, our board chair is here joining us and I just want to recognize and say thank you, um, Madam Chair uh, Greenberg. To, uh, for attending our first Q&A session for the 2020 Demographic Report. Uh, and with that, um, thank you all so much again for attending. Uh, have a great weekend and we will be in touch and we hope to see you again next Friday at 1130. Bye for now.